Anyway, okay. Uh, yeah, if you want to give to the apostolic outreach of Phil and Judy, we've got a drop down on our website now on the app. You can go in and look under missions, and there will be, among the other things we support, now there will be a drop down for them. So you can add a burden of financial giving to uh, planting churches all over uh, south of the border, just about anywhere you could imagine. All right. Well, bless the Lord, it is a good day, and I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about the key to being successful in God. How do you be victorious all the time? Now, what I'm going to talk to you about is not how to overcome everything in the natural world. I'm going to talk to you about how to overcome yourself and your attitudes of doubt and fear that the devil uses to keep you defeated as a Christian. The devil's always going to use thoughts, right? That's how he came into, that's how sin came into humanity. The serpent talking to the woman, you know, it was thoughts of negativity about God and his plan. And that's what the devil's always using. Let's look at a story in the Bible that is an amazing story to me. And one of my favorite Bible characters is, I'm sure most of you, uh, the King David and what God did in his life through his life and all the beautiful Psalms that came from this exact thing. Psalms that came from David's relationship with God primarily formed in the crucibles of life, primarily in his low times. Think, how did David write so many psalms? He must have had a lot of happy times in the presence of God with all God's people around singing as he strummed his harp to have that many psalms. Did you know that a large majority of them were written at his low point? when he really needed God, and he would turn his heart to God and call upon God. When the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart, it doesn't mean his heart was made like God's. It means he kept turning his heart all the time to God's and wanting God's heart. He was running after God's heart. He was after, you know, that guy's after me. No, he was after God. He was after God's heart. And uh, it doesn't mean that he just was born with a better heart than you. He fed his heart faith, promises, memories of God's faithfulness, and prayers and songs that became psalms of the Bible about God's goodness and faithfulness. And he often would pray that God would destroy wicked people too because that was part of his life as Lord destroy the ungodly but establish the just. So let's listen now. If you would uh, turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 30, uh, I want to read this brief story that brings David to the lowest point of his entire life. 1 Samuel uh, chapter 30 at verse 1 says, Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had had invaded the south and Ziklag attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city and there it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Lord, I just pray that you would bless your word to our hearts and help us as we read this story to learn your ways and to learn how people of old would turn their hearts to you and find strength in a time when there was no natural strength to be found. But strength from God came to strengthen people of God because they learned the secret of a victorious life. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to give you a little bit of the backstory here. David, as you know, as a young man, he killed Goliath. You know, the sling and the stone and the Goliath and the sword, Goliath, they estimate, were, was like nine foot six, almost ten feet tall. Think of a man who, if he stood on his tiptoes, would bump a basketball, ten foot basketball rim. And he, he's a big guy. And, of course, he was called the champion of Gath. He was the, and he would get out and defy Israel's armies. And you know the story, David is a shepherd boy, and he's out watching his dad's sheep, and he goes to the army to bring food to his brothers, and he hears this giant champion defying the armies of Israel and Israel's God. Well, to most of the soldiers, the defiance was personal to them. To David, it was a defiance of his God. 
the God of Israel. It was a a defiance of the very hope of the nation that he was a part of. God, Jehovah the Lord, loving and preserving his people and sending a Messiah to the earth through them. All of that was represented in that giant's defiance. So David went to the king and said, I'm not afraid of him. God's helped me kill lion and bears out watching daddy's sheep and I'll take on this dude. And he went and said to him, he said, you come to me with a with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel, and I will take your head from you this day. And the Bible says he slung his slingshot, you know, the old-fashioned kind. You'd put a rock in it and and nail that guy right in the forehead. One of the few places on his whole body that wasn't protected by metal armor. Now, he might have been a good shot, but it, I, I think that God honored his faith and just might have helped the stone hit in exactly the right place because it knocked the guy out and unconscious and down, and he ran over and cut off his head with his own sword. Now, that thrust David into national spotlight as a teenager, not the healthiest circumstance for a teen. Think about it. As a teenager, they began to sing national songs about him because he immediately was recruited to Saul's armor. Because again, even though there were a lot of carnal, natural, backslidden people like King Saul within the people of God, they were the people of God and they knew that God had helped the young man. The guy, kid had faith and they honored that kind of stuff in the, among the nation of Israel. So they made him a warrior and the Bible says he behaved himself wisely and pretty soon Within a few months or a few years, he was over the army. And and then, of course, everything started going sideways. And he became a fugitive. And here's what I want you to understand. When David had faith enough to kill a giant, God deemed it necessary to increase that faith through 10 years of wilderness danger and wandering so that he could be a king. Giant-killing faith and kingly faith are different in God's mind. To have faith to do one big thing that is amazing was good, but it was a starting place for a man who would have to, in his life, do dozens and dozens of amazing things of faith for God. And so God put him through wilderness wandering. So in the very beginning of this fugitive life, He runs as a young man. They think he might have been 24 years old. Might have been only three or four years from the time he killed Goliath, who was the champion of Gath. He runs to the king of Gath for shelter. He defects to try to hide. Hide from my armies, which hate me, my king, which is chasing me, and run over here. And so that's the story when... They saw him and said, isn't this David that kills all the Philistines? And they, they, they quoted the national song that Israel sang about him. And, and the, the king of Gath looked at him and said, what are you doing here? David realized he was about to lose his head, so he pretended to be crazy. And started scratching on the doors and letting spit run down his beard and, and acting weird, you know. And, and it freaked him out. And they said, get him out of here. So when he got out of there, he ran and he went into this, uh, the season of time in the cave of Adullam or cave of Adullam that you read about in, in Samuel in those 10 years. That's where him and the mighty men lived for a long time. That's where his family came. And the Bible says, again, David's mighty men were not mighty when, he got the, when he, they first defected to him. They, the Bible says they were discontent, in debt, and discouraged. And all of those people came. So he was a, a, a leader of a band of rejected uh, depressed, discouraged, indebted people. Oh, for joy. What what a wonderful uh, occupation he has now. Well, here's the point, is that it didn't start good and powerful. But between then and now, this story, which is the end of the 10-year period, David had become a respected captain of what is called the 600 mighty men of David. Mighty men that, were, that got reputations of doing tremendous feats in battle. They were like the special forces team of that era of history that everybody revered. And so this time when he goes back to the king of Gath, 
He is so confident in who God's made him and in what his reputation is that he just marches right into the same king that wouldn't receive him 10 years ago. He comes with all of his fighting men and said, we need to defect and be over here to stay away from the armies of Saul that are trying to kill us. This time, the king accepts him, the king of Gath, and gives him a town named Ziklag to stay in. And he stays there for like a year and a half. And this is the end of that period. And what's happened is, in this period of time, there's another war brewing between Israel and the Philistines who lived along the coast there of the Mediterranean, Israel inland where Jerusalem and all of that stuff is in the Sea of Galilee. So there, the Philistines are going to fight him again. And so they line up for battle, and Aksius, the king of Gath, ha- has David's mighty men, which is like, man, the, the SEAL Team 6 of the Judean wilderness is with us. How, be- how much better can it get? You know, the, those guys can kill anybody. But the Lord turns the heart of the Philistine lords against David. And they say, what are these Hebrews doing here? We can't have them here. Get them out of here. They might turn on us in battle. Get them out of here. So that is the setting in which our story begins. Our story begins saying, when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, where came from where? They came, listen to me, they came from a battle in which for the first time in their careers as, as fighting men, they had been turned away without a fight and without victory. It was an unknown experience for them. It was a rejection that sorely leaned on their pride. It was like, what? What do you mean we can't fight? You want to fight about it? We know how to fight. And so for them to be rejected by the Philistines was an offense to them. So they are coming home, not knowing what they're going to tell their wives, wondering how they're explaining to their teenage kids, what, did you fight? Is there any spoil of war? Did you bring me a lamb? Did you bring me a dog? Did you bring me anything, Dad? I thought... What, what happened here? Because that's the way this group had made a living for the last two years is they'd gone out on raiding parties and raid these nomadic villages of the South Desert there and would kill people and bring back spoil. That's what they did for a living. You say, well, man, how could they do that? Well, there, there was a lot of that in those days because God was training his people through natural things natural men, natural armies, natural enemies, how to have faith in a spiritual God. And so the enemies that they came against were enemies of God. And David would do this unknown to the Philistines. He actually kind of deceived them into thinking that he was attacking southern Israel. He was attacking in southern Israel, but he wasn't attacking Israelites. He was attacking Amalekites who now have come and attacked him. Now, I want to just set this setting up because these guys are coming home a little bummed occupationally. You know, they've been rejected from a battle line, and they're wondering how the next few days are going to go. They've been with David for almost 10 years. They're weary in running from Saul. They finally have found solace with the Philistines. Now they've been rejected by them. Discouragement of being rejected as fighting men. Weary from a three-day march on the heels of this rejection. Tired, maybe hungry, looking forward to a home-cooked meal in their own beds and their own families. No spoils of war. No joy of women and children running out to welcome the celebrated victory heroes of those days gone by. What are they going to say? How are they going to brace how to explain things? Then they come over a hill and smoke from their homes being on fire arises before their eyes and terror strikes their hearts. And now they hurry home and brace themselves to, to find loved ones burned to death. And they find to their shock, nobody and nothing. Nothing but burning buildings. Now, here, let me continue just reading this passage because I want to, I, I stopped just before we got to the end. It says, so David and his men came to the city, and there it was burned with fire, their wives and their sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him, this is verse 4 of 1 Samuel 30, David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Verse 6, now David was greatly distressed 
For the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his son and his daughter. Who were the Amalekites? The Amalekites were descendants of Amalek, a grandson of Esau. They had always been enemies of Israel, even though they were relatives. You know, their, their papa sons back a few generations were brothers, and, and they were, but they, you know, one was the godly line, one was the ungodly line from the same original family of Isaac. And so uh, they are fighting against Israel, and God had cursed them at the time of Moses. I want you to listen to the words of God. In Moses' Moses's, uh, day, this is Exodus 17, and this is as Israel is coming out of Egypt. They've just come out, you know, the first... 10, 11 chapters of Exodus is all the plagues in Egypt and Israel getting out across the Red Sea. We're now in chapter 17. We haven't got to Sinai where the giving of the law, the giving, the building of the tabernacle, the order of the the tribes, which side they camp on, none of the order, they're not even a nation yet. They're just a crowd of slaves walking through the sand. And it says, now Amalek came in verse 8, Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Joshua, this verse 13, so Joshua would defeated Amalek, defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Verse 14, then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembering of Amalek from under heaven. How many are glad you're not part of Amalek at this point in the game? God is saying, I'm going to blot their remembrance out from under heaven. And Moses built an altar, and he called its name, The Lord is My Banner. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn, I will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So Moses, here's what's interesting to me here. God's name was revealed throughout stories of the Old Testament. And God didn't just show up and show Adam everything about him. Adam had a certain knowledge of God, but, you know, the Bible says God is vast and his ways are past us finding everything out about. So God would reveal himself kind of experientially in stories of the Old Testament. For instance, when Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac on the hill of, called Mount Moriah, and he gets there, and all of a sudden the Lord speaks to him and says, don't slay your son, and he turns, and there's a ram in the bush. The Bible says the Lord revealed himself to Abraham as Jehovah Jireh. And Abraham said, the Lord is my Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who sees ahead and provides what I need when I get there. That's a knowledge of God. And it came in an experience of one of the patriarchs. This is another time. Moses says, God has said he's going to come after those people who came after us, and he has declared... He is going to be our banner, Jehovah Nissi, the Lord my banner. A, when the enemy comes in like the flood, the Lord is going to lift up a standard against him. A standard is like a, a banner, a, a symbol. The, the God of heaven is on the march here. You're in trouble. And so this is all part of this story of Amalek. Now, here's what we need to understand. On the way to Sinai, before the law, the congregation of tribes and leaders and They don't have leaders. They don't have armies. They're not established as a nation. They were just coming out of Egypt, confused, wandering, double-minded, some of them wanting to go back. And Moses talks about this again in Deuteronomy 25. If we look at Deuteronomy 25 and verse 17, Moses is saying, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at the rear when you were tired, when you were weary, he did not fear God. Therefore, it shall be when you are given your rest, uh, down at the bottom of verse 19, that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. So the Amalekites, in spite of the fact that they were a kindred race, were determined to fight against the people of Israel began an insidious attack at the rear of the Hebrews when they were exhausted and weary. They were mercenaries. They were not bold fighters who would face off at the front of the line out front, but they were cowards and sneaks preying on the weak. It's like David says in Psalms 18, they confronted me in the day of my calamity. 
I was already having a bad day, and then these guys take advantage of my weakness and my bad day and come and kick me while I'm down. That's the kind of people they are. Now, in Bible studies, Bible students, Bible scholars often refer in, in the typology of the Bible that Amalek is a type of the flesh in this way. Amalek was always sneaking around and trying to attack Israel from behind, even though they were a relative. Think about your flesh. Even though you're familiar with your carnal nature and your natural man, think of how often the devil's using it. When you're thinking about at least, you get a temptation, you get an angst, you get a thought, you get something, and, it, it, and it, it's frustrating you. It's like when you're weak, when you're tired, when you're not ready for it, then you get an attack from the world and the flesh and the devil. And it's our flesh and our natural thing that's with us from generation to generation. For many years we fight. It seems as though we fight from the time we're saved until the time we go to heaven with the world and the flesh and the devil. That's that nature of man, that carnal nature that's a part of us. So God says, again, in the New Testament, in the spiritual uh, realm that we live in, crucify the flesh. The flesh and the spirit have no joyous relationship with each other. They are at odds with each other all the time. So you can't cast flesh out. You just have to kill it. And how do you kill the flesh? That's what the Bible calls the cross of the Christian life. His way instead of my way. I want, but he wants. I'd rather, but he said. I'm upset, but he said, don't lose your peace. I'm angry at this person, but he said, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. I'm ready to be offended, but he said, you better forgive 490 times just today. Now, it's choosing his way that crucifies that flesh. And he's just saying, you're going to have war with Amalek because the God of heaven, who is a banner against the enemy of your soul, has revealed himself to his people as the Lord who has declared the end of Amalek. And to wipe their remembrance from the earth. And there's coming a day when we stand before the Lord and he wipes every tear from our eye. There'll be no more sin and no more sorrow and no more sickness and none of that stuff. And we're going to fight it until we get there. Because as soon as you stop and compromise with the flesh, you have begun to die. Because the flesh will always come back to kill you. Now, so in our story... David had done raids on Amalekite villages because that was the calling of the people of God for generations. He had no pang of conscience when he killed every living human being in an Amalekite village because he was called to be king and anointed to be king because Saul had failed to do just that. Saul had been told by the prophet Samuel, go and wipe the remembrance of Amalek from the earth, just like Moses told us to so many generations ago, and Saul didn't do it. He went and kept a few people alive and kept the nice people and kept the nice sheep, and and then Amalek ended up being a continued problem. It teaches us that you can't only partly kill the flesh. You've got to constantly work on denying yourself and taking up your cross and following Jesus. Now, this relates to our story how that when Amalek came back and attacked David, it's, it's a double blow because the very people we were supposed to uh, wipe out from the earth, and we haven't as a people all these years, have now devastated us. And it's the mercy of God that they didn't kill anybody because David had killed all their people. And they just came and captured them all and all their stuff and took them along their way. And it just shows the mercy of God that he was protecting, even though these mighty men and David's troop, they come here, they're shocked, they can't believe what they see, the Amalekites. And again, again, it doesn't say specifically uh, in that part how, how they knew. Eventually, they run upon an Egyptian boy, and they say, who are you from? He said, I'm a servant of Amalekite. And he said, do you know where, where these people are? He said, they're down here, and they've got all your stuff, and it's a day's journey, and I can show you where it is. And so that, that is later in the story. But here's what we want to ask. How did David develop an attitude and a spirit and a faith and a mental habit of thinking that would resist fear, 
that would resist a spirit of rejection, a spirit of betrayal, would resist all the things that were coming on him. He, he, his fighting team that is known for its excellence has been re- rejected from war. He returns home after a three-day march, hungry, tired, ready to clean up, have a home-cooked meal, and hug the wife and kids, and the city's on fire. Then they find out that who's burnt it is the Amalekites. So you got wham, wham, wham. You know, one of the things that uh, we hear in the whole story here is, is that these circumstances of crisis that come cause men to do absurd things. One comment, I think it was Matthew Henry, who said, what absurdities will men of ungoverned passions plunge their self into? If, you know, if we even have a legal term called crimes of passion, which admits the fact that people can get so emotionally distraught that they can do crazy things they wouldn't do otherwise. And that's kind of the condition of these men. It's like when the children of Israel got frustrated with Moses What Instead of saying, hey, can we talk about this and have a council and maybe have a vote? No, they said, let's kill Moses and get another leader. That's what they said. And here these guys are going back to the same thing. All right, well, we've given David nine and a half years of our life. Some of them have been with him for 10 years. Now, David was 10 years in the wilderness. And you know what? This is about as bad as it gets. We can't fight anymore. And now we've lost everything that's important to us in one fell swoop. Our occupational embarrassment is stinging our hearts, and now our domestic life has been shattered, and everything we own is on fire, and men who kill for a living are ready to kill. So they turn their energy against their leader, David. Now, you'd think David would run or draw his sword or challenge them and start arguing with him, but no. The Bible says David encouraged himself in God. David encouraged himself in God. He strengthened himself in God. And here's what I want to say. At at the end of the 10 years of David's wilderness wanderings, he is surviving one of the worst days of his life, not because he's so spiritually strong and is a superman in God. It's not because he just muscled up and was better than everybody else. No, no. David, as weak as he was, as natural as he was, had developed a habit that you don't see and it isn't revealed in our story, but is revealed in the other stories and in the other psalms that he wrote about the events that he called on God as a habit when he was at his wit's end. He had developed a habit of turning his eyes upon Jesus. He had developed again and again when He didn't know what to do. He would call on the Lord. When he was running from Saul, he would ask the Lord for help. When he was, you know, people were after him, he would go to God. He would cry out to God. And some of the Psalms that we read, we don't even realize that they are David in distress that created the setting for that Psalm. Let me read you a couple, in fact. It's just kind of amazing. You hear, so David's come. Uh, He sees the Amalekites have ripped open uh, the, the hearts of the men, they have bitterness of soul. They weep until they couldn't weep anymore. Have, have you ever cried until your eyes hurt? How many of you have ever cried enough till your forehead just kind of throbbed? It's just like, well, I can't cry very much more now. I mean, you can cry until you can hardly cry anymore. And, you know, studies say that men and women both cry. Women cry a little more than men, but the point is that crying is a part of human emotion, and uh, it's actually a healthy part of life so not crying is an unhealthy thing but you can cry till you can't cry anymore and what so they're led to this from all of these negatives that I've described and then they turn on David when the Bible says David was greatly distressed it doesn't mean that he was afraid and this is what's amazing to me the word distressed means to be restricted tied up cramped be in a bind be in a narrow place doesn't include fear or terror or panic. You think, all my guys are against me, I'm in trouble. No, he knew because he had a discipline of mind 
that he needed to talk to God, find a solution in God, remember the promises of God, refresh himself on the faithfulness of God. He knew there was one place he had to go to avoid being slaughtered by his own men. And it wasn't for his sword. It was for his heart to cling to his God and to find strength in that place. How do I know? Well, because uh, David had, and, and again, one of the reasons I feel like this is so important, if I could say, is that we all face discouragement. We all go through times when life is hard. We all go through things when it's not going well. We all go through exhaustion. We all feel like we're tired of something. We can't do this anymore. We all think at times people are against us or we've been hurt by our closest friends. We, we, all, ha- we, we all have that. But discouragement and getting down under circumstances is a, is a real strategic dagger of Satan's arsenal. And, and the reason is because it's built on a lie. The reason Satan uses it, he's the father of lies. And, and the dagger of discouragement is built on the lie that God's not involved in this bad situation. So you can be discouraged about it. I'm bummed. I had a hard day. But, but, but God's here. Well, I, don't, I can't see him. When have you ever seen God? He's always been here. He's always helping. You know, you not seeing him has no bearing on the reality of him being here or not. God is here. He's been faithful to you. He'll be faithful again. So, again, what discouragement based on the lie that God's not involved here or he's not enough here, that God is not working for my good in this situation, that these circumstances are just greater than my faith, that's when you need the faith of God and not the focus on earthly circumstances. You need divine faith when you're in the midst of something that your human strength cannot control. So David had developed a habit of running to God in times of trouble. Look at the, uh, the, what the Bible says, and uh, I'm going to read one of his psalms it's in Psalm 56. We have some of David's own prayers and songs that became psalms to remember. And Psalm 56, verse 1 says, to the, it's the title of it is, To the chief musician set to the silent dove in distant lands, a mitkem, a mitkem of David, when the Philistines had captured him in Gath. Oh, this goes back to the 10 years before, the first time when he had to spit on his beard to get away from them. All right? Did you know that as soon as he got in a place where he could grab his harp and start praying and singing, that he wrote this psalm? Be merciful to me, O God, for man would swallow me up. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day. For there are many who fight against me, O Most High. Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. See, I just want to say a lot of times we know parts of Psalms or we know phrases from the Bible and we forget where they come from. I've heard this all my life. Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. We used to teach kids that song. Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Well, it comes from David. He has just wiped the spittle off of his beard and escaped from Gath and gone over the hill and stopped by a brook to refresh himself and got out his harp and began to pray and sing and declare faith unto God. And this is what he said. In God, I will put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Wow. Wow. That's a pretty big statement of faith when, you have, when your flesh has just barely escaped from the flesh of the Philistines and their ability to kill you. You have just barely got out of their death grip and you're saying, what can man do to me? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? He's changing his attitude from a natural focus to a spiritual focus and instead of focusing on men's ability to hurt him, he's focusing on God's ability to save him. And it's not because he's in a worship service and he's having a great Sunday and he just is thinking prophetically and having a good day. It's because in his worst day, he has learned to call upon the name of the Lord and to think about God and to remember the faithfulness of God and to quote his promises and remember his calling and remember what he said and remember what he's done. He remembers that he helped him kill a giant. He remembers that he protected him from his national army chasing him. He could remember these things because he practiced doing just that every time he had the chance. He developed a mindset and a habit of turning to the Lord. 
You number my wanderings. You put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies turn back. How did David know that? From crying out to God and watching his enemies turn back. Again, you know, he's writing things that we're learning from and we take and we forget what inspired that. And here's what I'm saying. God wants to sing songs through you. He wants to pour faith through you. And sometimes we think, well, I'm going to go to church and see if God will speak to me. No, you speak to God on your worst day of the week. You call on God whenever you find time. You cry out to God in your car, at the job, on the lunch hour, in the shower, wherever you've got a moment where you think about the Lord and you're going to say, God, I need help with this. I need you to turn this around. Would you help me? You're my source. You've always been faithful. And you develop a discipline that thinks about the Lord and calls upon him because that's what David did. And that's the only thing that saved him when his men were going to kill him. When everything was against him on the worst day of his life, he had a habit of turning to the Lord. And in turning to the Lord, he found strength from the Lord. And finding strength from the Lord, he was able to stand back up and think clear and not be emotional and turn around and call the priest and say, shall we pursue them and will we recover all? And the priest talked to God and came back to him and said, the word of the Lord is, you shall pursue and you will recover all. Everybody say all. All's a good word when you're reporting that to the men who are all missing something. And you say, we're going to get them all back. How could that happen? Because David had penned words like these. Verse 13, for you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of the living? See, whenever I'm afraid, I'll trust in you. Literally, it means the day when I'm afraid or when the day comes that I feel fear creeping in over me by an act of my will, I, yes, even I, weak as I am or as dominated by circumstances beyond my control as I am now, I will trust in my God right now for me. You just get a hold of it. You just say, I'm... I'm not going to let the devil control my thinking. I will praise God. I will praise his word. It means with God's help by his grace, I am ready to praise him whatever sentence he pronounces and whatever goes forth from his mighty hand. What about this psalm? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt the name, his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. That's Psalm 34. What's the title of Psalm 34? A Psalm of David when he pretended madness before Abimelech who drove him away and he departed. The circumstance doesn't even make sense with the song. You're saying, David, how, how did you get all prophetic and psalmic when you're in so much trouble? Because he chose to. Because he said, I'd rather sing to the Lord than cry about the enemy. I'd rather sing to the Lord but instead of worrying about my own soul. I'd rather call on God and be a person who runs after God. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Look at all these scriptures that we quote and make songs about all the time. We forget, where did they come? Where did David first think and pen those words and pray those tears to God? The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. What do you mean, David? Well, I can tell you a story how he just delivered me. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them and delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is near those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He guards his bones. Not one of them is broken. Right in the middle of his praise song, he gets a messianic prophecy. That's quoted in the New Testament from David's psalm as a psalm about Jesus on the cross. And it says, the psalm, psalm said, none of his bones will be broken. So he's just out of Gath. He's running for his life. He's just got the spit off his beard. And he's singing to the Lord. And he's prophesying about the Messiah. Come on, somebody. 
We're talking about a discipline that will make you victorious. We're talking about a way of thinking that will help you. We're talking about developing a habit of thought that dwells on the Lord. We're talking about casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity under the obedience of Christ so we can be truly Christ followers and not negative, fearful, whiny, disappointed, offended, mully grubbing, crawling around uh, with the snails instead of up in the realm of the spirit and flying with the eagles. It's a way we decide to be. It's a, dis- de- it's a decision we make and a habit we form. See, as he stops running from the Philistines at Gath, wipes the spit off his beard and turns his heart to the Lord and the Lord's great power to save, David sets a pattern for his thought life and develops a habit that when his life will be narrowly escaped danger many more times over the next years, his wilderness school of learning taught him that to be a man of God, that God could use mightily, he had to always turn his eyes to the Lord and constantly focus on the good, on the promise, on the faithfulness, on the power on the history of God's people, on how many times he could recount, on the prophecy of Samuel, on the anointing oil, on everything good related to God working in his life. He dwelt on that. He clung to that. And so when David was in trouble, he didn't go for the bottle. He didn't go for aspirin. He didn't go for a bad movie. He didn't run to Egypt's shade. He ran to the Lord. He developed a habit of heart after God. And so today I'm asking you to look to the Lord for help always in every situation. Well, it's not a big deal. I can handle it myself. Not a good, not a good habit. I mean, handle it all you want, but talk to God on the way. Thank God for the wisdom. Thank God for the grace. Thank God for the money. Thank God for the car. Thank God for whatever you got. Don't be proud and independent of God. Be dependent and thankful to God for everything you have, for breath, for life, for living another day, for coming to another church service. Everything God's given us. He's given us all things necessary for life and godliness. Let's thank Him. Let's praise Him. We must remember His great and precious promises. We must personally trust in His care. What do I mean personally trust? Three things that make up faith. Knowledge. Faith comes by hearing the word. You got to have knowledge. Belief. You got to believe what you hear. And then you have to trust that it is good and will work for you. You have to personally trust. Trust is what brings belief and faith into your experience. You got to personally trust the Lord. The Bible works. The scriptures are true. These things changed people's lives throughout history. It'll change your life. But you got to think about the Lord. Think about the Lord. Think about his goodness. And throughout the Psalms, we see it in the prophets. Isaiah 43, one, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You're mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they won't overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you're not going to be burned. The flame will not scorch you. Because I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. How about Habakkuk 3.17? Though the fig tree does not blossom, nor there be no fruit on the vine. Though the labor of the olive fail and the fields yield no fruit. Though the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation because the Lord God is my strength. It's the confession of the godly throughout history. Circumstance and culture and economies and jobs and money and bank accounts and homes and cars and things do not matter near as much as your attitude of faith about everything you encounter. Say, well, I'll build faith when I have a challenge. No, you won't. You'll fail in the challenge because you haven't built faith day to day. Build faith every day. Ask the Lord for things all along the way. Pray for people. Declare his goodness. Talk to the Lord. Be a spiritual person. Remember, you're more spiritual than you are natural. If you can see it, it's dying and passing away. 
If you cannot see it, it's enduring and lasting forever. A spiritual kingdom that cannot be shaken is what God's putting inside of us. Our spirit knows that we need to live according to it. We need to speak according to it. We need to develop habits of thought and speech according to his kingdom. Would you stand with your feet with me? with me on your feet and stand to your feet and let's pray and I want to ask if you are here today and you say Pastor Mark the Holy Spirit's been speaking to me and I uh, I believe I need to change some habits of thought I believe I need to change some habits of mental focus I believe I need to change some habits of complaining and criticism. I believe I need to change some habits of fear and doubt. I I believe I need to change some ways I think about life and about God. I believe the Lord is giving us a key here today, and it's a key for me, and it's a key for you. And I'm one standing right here saying, I want to develop a better discipline of thought and habit of life that focuses on God and knows how to find strength from Him for every day. And if that's you today and you want that same thing, would you just join me down front and let's just pray and ask Him to come into our hearts and change us, Lord. Help us not to stay the same. We don't want to be the same people defeated by satanic reasoning and doubt and fear and unbelief and all the thought casters' thoughts. Lord, we want to be people of power. We want to be people of might. We want to be people that know our God and are strong and do exploits in our generation. Lord, we want to be the kind of people who can say, like the Bible says, in awesome deeds of righteousness, you have come and answered us, O God. We want you to move in our generation and in our life. We want you to do for us what you did for David. We want hearts that are after you. We want hearts that are turning to you. We want hearts that are clinging to you. Lord, help us not to cling to natural things, but help us to cling to Jesus. Uh, Help us just to cling to him and learn to cling quickly and learn to not wait till we're exasperated before we pray, but learn to pray at the beginning of challenges, at the beginning of the day, to commit our heart to you and our mind to you and our thoughts to you and our responses to you and say, Lord, uh, I'm going to believe you and I'm going to walk in your way and I'm going to remember your promises. I'm going to quote some scriptures today. I'm going to look up a good scripture on my lunch hour and develop it into my life of thought. Lord Jesus, change us. Help us to see the devil's strategy to defeat us through our thought life and through our habits of thinking and let us like David develop a heart habit of running to you. We cry out to you and say, change our hearts, O God. In the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Let's continue to pray as we sing. God wants to change us all.
church, we're just going to continue to worship. These altars are open. If you need prayer for anything, we are here for you. There's people on either side to pray with you. We're going to continue to worship, but you are dismissed. Have a beautiful day. Pulling on the God of Jeremy, whose favor